Welcome back to TactCast, a production of the Tennessee Academy of Christian Thought. Morning, Phil. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. All right, so today I guess we have our, uh, uh, we're going into a new book. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Right, so so uh, what are we doing? So it's uh, Sigurd Grindheim's uh, Christology and the Synoptic Gospels. Gospels? I read the first chapter. <laughs> you want me to? <laughs> okay, good, because that's what I plan on talking about today. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, uh, reading this first chapter actually yeah. reminded me of um, the course that I, well, the independent study that I did with you for some of my graduate work. Yeah, right. Uh, I looked at a lot of the same texts yeah. uh, for Messianic Expectation. And I wondered if uh, if it would bring back memories. Yeah, it sure did. It sure did. Um, so, uh, this is this whole first chapter... Um, well, actually, do you uh, you want to like summarize kind of like the the book itself, like what what? Yeah, you know, okay, that's uh, a good idea. Yeah. So, uh, what Grindheim is doing is just uh, looking at uh, the 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 Christology in the Synoptic Gospels. So, the Synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the ones that sort of look at the life of Jesus from a similar perspective, um, as, and John sort of in a different category. Um, and, and what is it? What? How would you say it? Christology? What is? Yeah. Christology? Okay. So Christology then is um, the <clears throat> the uh, opinions about uh, Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what? How the authors of the Synoptic Gospels um, viewed Jesus's role and relationship to God? Shall we say that? Yeah. No, that's so. So what Grindheim is doing is going through the synoptics and uh, looking at uh, how they viewed uh, Jesus, um, yeah, in, in relation to God, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, beyond the human aspect, I, per, I, I guess would be a good way to say it. Because, you know, traditionally, well, maybe not traditionally, but the s- scholarship often uh, holds that the... the there's a development in Christology from a so-called low Christology where Jesus is not necessarily viewed uh, in some of the synoptics as as being God, certainly. Um, he's, he's human, but he's special, but he's still human. Mm-hmm. And then the high Christology uh, of John where, um, you know, John is clearly equating Jesus with Godhood. Right. And so scholars often say that there's a development from the low Christology in the earliest synoptics to the high Christology of the later Gospel of John. And so Grindheim is looking at what the Christology is in these synoptics. Yeah, so his his breakdown, you know, the first chapter, yeah. he's, he's giving actually just a, a background in um, Messianic expectation amongst Second Temple Jews. So right. he's looking at um, what do you writings. mean by Second Temple Jews? Yeah, so these <laughs> are uh, the writings after the fall of the first Solomon's Temple. Right. Um, so the entire time between then and, well, 70, um, when the next temple's uh, destroyed. Destroyed by the Romans. Yeah, right. that's that's uh, so scholars call that Second Temple Jewish period. Yep. Yeah. So um, you'll have, uh, th- there's a lot of writings in Second Temple Judaism that's not included in uh, our Bibles. Right. Uh, and they have a lot to say about uh, what they're looking for in a Messiah. Right. Um, and a lot of like really interesting language and a lot of that that uh, Grinheim is dealing with. Yeah. Um, so he breaks it down. The first chapter, which we're going to go over today, is um, the sort of background messianic expectation. Um, now he has the the book is only four chapters. Yeah. Um, so he's got the the messianic expectation, the background to it, and then second chapter is Christology and Mark's gospel, and then Matthew's gospel, and then Luke's gospel. Uh, and funny enough, I I thought the order was kind of interesting because it's not the same order that you find in you know our Bible. Oh you right, see yeah, absolutely. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but he starts with Mark here. Yeah, so why do you suppose that is? Oh, well, I suppose that it's <laughs> probably because Mark was the first gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Generally dated as the earliest of the gospels. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's, of course, you know, he's dealing with this in a scholarly manner. So right. he's going to go with the earliest first because the idea is to show this sort of, you know, progression. Right. Um, so, but I do find that interesting because I really don't understand why we... 
Oh, yeah. well, the Bibles are sort of ordered as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, that's funny. I didn't yeah. even notice it. I just, yeah. you know, I, no, yeah, Mark's earliest, uh, the first he's going to deal with, of course. Uh, yeah. But that's a good point. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we get into, like, the specific content in Chapter 1, um, what do you think of, you know, his writing style, um, oh. kind of what he's dealing with? So I, I found this a breath of fresh air. <laughs> well, compared to Hayes, right? So, yeah. yeah, it's very straightforward, very clear. Um, I think very accessible. So mm-hmm. anybody um, could pick this up, I think, and and um, and read it with you know a fair amount of ease. So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's very clearly. And he concludes every section. He has a conclusion, right? So it's it's really well done. So I'll tell you my favorite aspect of his writing. Um, you know, usually when we read these Christian texts and Christian scholars, you know, their you their audience is typically familiar with whatever work they're referencing. Yes, yeah. Um, but it's not always the case, I and mean, you, know, you can't memorize. Uh, it's hard to memorize a whole lot of scripture. So when yeah. people you when you're constantly referencing different texts, you typically have to have. You know the text open right beside you, yeah. And it's it's really frustrating. You constantly have to go back to what you're reading versus the text they're referencing and all this. And I loved that uh, Grinheim, when he references something, he pretty much includes it right there in the text, and uh, you can read it right there. You yeah. don't have to reference something else. And this was this just made it. It's very accessible to to anybody who's reading this. You don't have to have this sort of um, you know, background knowledge. It, 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 he does a very, very good job. Yeah, and there's also a glossary at the end to uh, sort of define and explain a lot of the terms. I, in fact, I wonder if this is meant to be a textbook in a seminary. Do you know? Yeah, I don't know that, actually. Um, but it would be a fantastic text to it use. It would be, for, yes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, probably a good one you should use for, you know, when people do independent studies with you for yeah. Second Temple Judaism. Yeah, a good well, idea, I got a, I got a <laughs> class on the book, Second Temple <laughs> Period, so I just got to teach it sometime. Um, well, yeah, so... Uh, I guess we can go ahead and get into the content. Um, go ahead and well, so yeah, uh-huh. in the first chapter, he basically goes it's straightforward. He goes through uh, all the different documents or texts uh, in Second Temple Jewish texts that deal with uh, messianic expectations or eschatological expectations. Eschatological, just meaning like at the end times, the eschaton, yeah. um, and um, he goes through them one by one and just lays out the texts that have uh, traditionally been interpreted as messianic or eschatological, and um, and then explains them and talks about different views regarding them. So how does um, so how do scholars uh, determine? What's a messianic text? Well, so he deals with this. He does. Uh, he does, and it's not clear. That's the problem. There's some yeah. debate about that, right? So you have one side, uh, one one set of opinions that say, well, it's got to mention Messiah, right? The word they have to say Messiah has to have right. Mashiach. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, and I think most most people, you know, believe that's a little bit rigid, right? There's mm-hmm. uh, other. The other side of things are maybe those who say, well, yeah, sure, if it mentions the Messiah, of course, but also if it talks about some sort of end, you know, end times, some eschaton, uh, yeah. that is messianic, although maybe not necessarily. Um, so it's not exactly clear. And I like Grindheim, and he deals with sort of all the texts that, mm-hmm. that have been or could be attributed to messianic or eschatological issues. So... so um so Grinheim, he's he said in this study, uh, we will therefore define the term Messiah as an eschatological figure that is understood as the fulfillment of God's promise to David. Mm. Um, so he's looking at anything that can reference. So he's not necessarily looking for the word Messiah, right, right, right. but he's looking at anything that fulfills this, uh, the eschaton and this, this yeah. promise to David. Yeah. I think that's a uh, eminently uh, legitimate uh, definition. Yeah, absolutely, um, and it's it's very clear once we st- once once we actually start talking about some of the different titles that are given and how they're used in the text, it makes complete sense. Yeah, um, that these you know are messianic. Yeah, um, 
so I, I don't think we have to have that sort of rigid idea of, of it has to have the word Mashiach in it or, right. you know, whatever. Um, so I think this is that is absolutely, he's right on point here. Yeah. Um, okay. So do you want to, th- what do you, what do you think? I mean, he's, I, I think maybe rather than going text by text, maybe we could think about in terms of what are some of the general categories, if you will, uh, ways that uh, Second Temple Jews looked at the Messiah or how they viewed what this uh, this figure might look like. Yeah, so, um, you know, partly in my independent study with you and, you know, kind of rereading a lot of things that, I, you know, I read yeah. uh, a few years ago now. Um, man, it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, especially these Second Temple Jews and, and early scholars, they mostly thought that the ideas um or they were th- this messianic figure they were usually talking about somebody in their present time yeah um some sort of ruler or it was Enoch or it was Moses yeah. or it was something else it was something that's already happened um and i think grindheim's point here is to basically say that christians brought something new Nobody saw these messianic figures as God Himself. Mm, yeah. In Second Temple Judaism, this was a later development by Christians. It was totally unique. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is important. Yeah. Um, so, in some sense, I think we have to talk a, a little bit about some specific uh, titles and stuff that he references sure. in here. Sure. Oh, sure. Um, so obviously not all of them because there's a, there's a ton of text that yeah, he references, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he starts you know like kind of the well known ones you know messianic psalms um, and these different promises to David and, uh, and those are clearly like the psalms right and I think in many of the prophets uh, particularly I think the minor prophets you've got the image of the Messiah is this sort of Davidic, it's particularly in Psalms, yeah. but this uh, kingly figure, right? Who's yeah, so going you know, the to, kingly, the yeah. the priestly figure, the priestly figure that takes the role of a king. Right, um, right, right. That's definitely, definitely so. Part it, of it. Like in the in the in the minor prophets, you you tend to see it seems that, uh, or maybe not just the minor prophets, but in the prophets, you tend to see uh, the Messiah as this kingly figure who's going to rescue Israel from or judah from you know these these non-jewish powers of syria or whatever right and the psalms it's clearly a, a kingly figure but then when you get to the the qumran community um and the qumran community is the community uh the jewish sect that produced what we call the dead sea scrolls right so yeah. you have tons of literature there uh produced um, that it's extra biblical, um, but in this Qumran community, it's it's pretty clear that the uh, the Messiah figures like a priestly, more like a priestly figure mm-hmm. and less kingly. Um, although there's some elements also in the Psalms of a priest and king together, or maybe two mes- messianic figures, a priest and a king. Yeah. Um. So. Yes, yeah, so I I want to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls a little bit. So okay. there's just a little small blurb here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I think um, I talk about this in my own classes for early world history and stuff. The Dead Sea Scrolls is just one of the most incredible finds. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, in human history, in my opinion. Yeah. Because there was, you know, the the charge that Muslims usually have against Christians is that, well, the Bible has been corrupted over time. And oh, uh-huh. it's, you know, through the translations and the... Uh, copying. There's tons and tons of errors, and you can't trust what it says yeah. or anything like that. Um, and it's, it's not just the Muslims, of course. Uh, Mormons will say the same thing, and okay. Jehovah's Witnesses believe, and um, you know a few others. And you have uh, uh, anyway. It's finding these these Dead Sea Scrolls found. I mean, they found pretty much um, fragments or near complete copies of uh, every book except for what, I think Ezra. Uh, yeah. yeah, I might be wrong in that one, but um, it's everything except for like one book. Yeah, um, which is and it shows. I mean, there's almost there's very few differences. I mean, the differences that are there, it's, you know, one one and a half, two percent, or whatever. It's mostly um, 
you know, just like misspellings or small things. Like there's no idea change. Right, right, right. And it shows that through 2,000 years, it remained intact. Yeah. Uh, It wasn't changed. Yeah, the other interesting thing or really uh, good thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is they open up all this literature that was unknown, you know, yeah. um, and it gives us an image of uh, of what, you know, Jews are thinking at the time of Jesus or just before, right? So the sort of things um, uh, uh, that was in, in, in their head, you know, and so uh, it opened up this whole... Um, study of of Second Temple Jewish uh, thought, so it, it's really, um, really just as you say, just an incredible find, significant scholarship. Yeah. Um, so Grinheim, he's uh, kind of the first time he kind of talks about the Qumran community. Mm-hmm. Says the Old Testament prophecies were often reinterpreted to apply to the community's own history. Oh, yeah. um, so in Zechariah three seven, they found a description of the sort of eschatological character that was distinguished from the Messiah who uh, would come later. And since they also thought that uh, those who revered the shepherd were... I'm trying to read this. It's not making sense. Um, so the poor ones of the flock is quite likely that they identified Zechariah's shepherd as their own leader, the teacher of righteousness. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and since the, the Qumran community really emphasized sort of uh, ritual purity yeah. uh, and um, obeying those, you know, precepts, then they, um, uh, you know, it stands to reason that their ideal sort of man as a messianic figure would be more of a priestly figure who would uh, uh, lead the community into this sort of, or lead, lead uh, I suppose, the 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 in the eschaton in in this righteousness this holiness this purity yeah so um do you recall uh it, so as you said earlier he mentioned how uh christians that there was no idea in the jewish thinking that the messiah would be god yeah. um and and he goes through you know we talked about the kingly figure uh related to david descendant from david the mm-hmm. priestly figure as well um there is also he talks about some categories that are not necessarily messianic but also significant like the angel of the lord melchizedek do you remember those <clears throat> yeah um uh in particular i remember a little bit about melchizedek um but I'm, I'm trying to go back through this text real quick where he talks about the Quam Run community. Um, I found it. So the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls is usually referred to as the Quam Run community. Most scholars convinced the community belonged to the Jewish group known as the Essenes. Yeah. Um, but it continues to be. But they um, were. They definitely had this sort of keen interest in eschatological events. The um, Essenes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. And there's this uh, sort of emphasis on this royal priesthood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they... Uh, I'm having trouble trying to find that one section I was looking for, but... Um, ah, here we go. So one of the fragments from the Qumran that um, is commanded the most scholarly attention is the Son of God document. Oh, okay. Uh, so 4Q246. Uh, so this was dated um, about 35 to 1 BCE. Um, so column two of this document, he says, introduces the intriguing character that he will be called the Son of God, mm. and they will call him the Son of the Most High. And I I love this one, why he puts the most scholarly attention to it. It's his, it it immediately the text once it introduces that the text immediately pre- proceeds to describe the enemies of God's people. Uh, so it's been argued that the Son of God should be understood as a name for a particularly reprehensible pagan king, mm. possibly Antiochus IV. Oh yeah, um, who described the the temple his son Alexander Bailas who bribed the high priest for political support. Um, or even the eschatological arch enemy of God's people. But he says it's more likely that the title is intended positively, 
uh, and that the Son of God be associated with the people of God who appear on stage in line four. So this figure could be understood as a guardian angel, uh, a coming Jewish ruler, um, Israel collectively, um, or is perhaps the most likely individual that represents the people. Yeah. Um, one thing that is interesting is the, the Son of God, is, as they have all seen it, is separate from God himself. Uh, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, that is the section that I was looking for. But I thought it was interesting how you'll find that um, there, most of these texts, they seem to, scholars will try to uh, place them to a very specific person, not one to come in the mm. future. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is typical. This is a sort of a misunderstanding of the word prophecy because a lot of people think that prophecy is always future telling, and right. that's not the case. It's It's often... You know, theological interpretation of present or past events. Right. Uh, right. So and that and that that is uh, a, a key characteristic of Jewish apocalyptic writing as well, right? So it, it has the appearance of a prophecy, um, but in, but in many ways, it's often sort of a spiritual interpretation of relatively current events, right? <clears throat> and you see a lot of that in. Uh, in Daniel, um, so which which leads us to the Son of Man discussion. Yeah. Um, well, um, so I th- I think sort of the whole point of this idea, I, I mean, is that um, the title, everything, it's it's all. Um, <laughs> Everything is all over the place yeah. within Jewish messianic expectation. So when you think of Jesus coming in, this is of course why some Jews accepted him, yeah. and others didn't. Like this is the issue, yeah. um, because it's since this messianic expectation could be, you know, interpreted in a way that it's it's some future figure for end times, but it could also kind of be referencing, you know, some current events or recent right, events right, or whatever. Right. Because they were interpreted in both ways, um, it's re- it's really easy, easy to, to see. Reject. Yeah, it's easy it's, to reject. Yeah. It's and it causes you know those early Christians to sort of have to take a, a very specific uh, it, hermeneutic um, mm-hmm. and interpretation of the uh, scriptures. So they look at things in just a different way than. Um, you know, some of the other Jews would have. But right. you have to understand that most of these these were Jews, too. Yeah. Um, so, and because the the interpretation of these these uh, Messianic texts are all over the place, you can kind of see why many rejected, some didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that's the whole point of this, this uh, or that's, that's the whole point of the book. Um, right, well, and we will, and we'll see, right, how the yeah. Gospel writers uh, interpreted uh, Jesus in light of these ideas i think so um and i guess so next week we're gonna do or next time we're gonna do the next chapter which deals with mark yep right? as we are definitely out of time <laughs> all right so <laughs> i'll see you next time yep see you next time Bye. thank you for watching tactcast a production of the tennessee academy of christian thought be sure to subscribe like and comment make sure to follow us over on our social medias Links in the description. Thanks for watching.